Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Lessons in Data Modeling with Donna Burbank and sponsored today by IDERA. Today, Donna will be discussing conceptual data models, how to get the attention of business users. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. We very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner for that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag LessonsDM. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and links to the recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently manage the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly in industry conferences. In fact, she will be speaking at at one of the Data Diversity upcoming conferences, Enterprise Data World 2017 in Atlanta, the first week of April here in just a uh, little over a week. She'll be starting with a tutorial on best practical steps to implementing metadata strategy at that event. So Donna, hello and welcome. Hello, thank you. Always a pleasure to do these webinars and it's good to see some familiar, I would say familiar faces, but familiar names and some, some of the names are uh, Faces are familiar as well, so thanks guys who join this on a regular basis. Um, and as Shannon mentioned, today we are talking about conceptual data models and hopefully we'll make them less conceptual and focus more on the second part of the conversation, which is really how to get the attention of business users and probably more even valuable, um, how to get business value out of these models. So uh, Shannon has always did an excellent overview of me, so I don't want to keep going on that. Um, just a few things, I am on Twitter at Donna Burbank, uh, and then today there's a hashtag, uh, LessonsDM, so if you are a Twitter fan, uh, continue the conversation online, and I know there's always a lot of good questions uh, at these events, so hopefully we'll try to leave some time for that at the end. Um, I think um, my bio is up there, so kind of have a long background in data modeling, metadata management, both in the field and with several um, product vendors, written a few books on data modeling, and probably most notable for this conversation um, was product man director of product management for a while at uh, IDEA, or, or back then it was um, Embarcadero ER Studio. So any of the really great uh, features of that product that you use are mine, and anything that doesn't work you don't like was built after I left, so <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Um, a bit about the series, and as Shannon mentioned, these are all recorded um, and the slides are available too. So if you missed any in the past, they are still out there. And I know a lot of folks who are busy during the day, you know, often have to catch them later. So we appreciate that as well. Uh, so we've done some things on uh, enterprise architecture, business intelligence in the past. You'll see the theme is to really put data modeling in context, uh, which hopefully we'll do a little bit slightly differently this time, but hopefully in that same theme, because um, data modeling in and of itself is, is well, we might find it interesting, but it's not really that interesting as just a standalone artifact. And that's what we'll try to head on today. But it's really only useful and useful to a business when you're doing something else with it, like BI or understanding the enterprise and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's kind of the theme we tried to uh, cover as well as some of the new technical technologies, things like graph databases that are hot now. So hopefully you can join us in some of the future events as well. Uh, they are all available for registration if you want to get them on your calendar early. I know some people do it all in January and then just <laughs> have them out there. So appreciate those folks that seem to keep coming back. So I appreciate that. So today the topic is going to be really about how a data model facilitates communication. And that, to me, um, is really the main topic of conceptual data modeling, um, is, is that business focus. So if we remember, and we'll go more about this, the focus is really on a business audience, and so the display and the rules and the things we're capturing really should be all about the business at this level. And the second note, I love to stress, um, that simplicity does not mean lack of importance, and, and I think, a lot of us in the industry, the more simple you make it, you sort of seem to get a lot less credit, right? Anyone can make it hard. Um, can you take a very 
complex topic like an organization or all the data that's flowing through an organization and really sum that up on a one pager. Um, and that's really the beauty of a well formed uh, conceptual data model. And, and that, that's the goal is to make something very complicated and make it really intuitive so you can really suss out those core concepts that really make sense. Um, and as always, a model or a tool or any technology is only part of the solution. And I think this is even more important when we are talking about a conceptual data model, because uh, the whole point of it is communication. And for some of you, I might go a little outside the line of what some people think of when they think of a, a conceptual data model, and I'll stick to it, because I think the goal is communication, right? So if someone wants to fly a plane with you know, smoke signals in the back to get the attention of the business, um, Go for it. You know, I think so. I think we have to be a little more creative sometimes to get some of the stakeholders that we're not particularly used to dealing with. So, and the process and best practices around that to get that consensus and buy in. And, you know, so that plays into some of the other things we'll be talking about throughout the year, like data governance and some of those things that really are another piece of the puddle, puzzle when we talk about data modeling. Um, so again, you've probably seen this framework again. Uh, hopefully it's helpful to kind of bring it back uh, to some some of the core concepts. So, you know, in our practice, we always start with the top down, why are we doing this? What's the business strategy and how does that align to a data strategy? And then we start from the bottom up as well of what's all the technology and you know, that we're talking about unstructured data here, is it all relational databases, et cetera, et cetera. And then all the pieces in between. And I don't, won't go in detail on this at the time. If you've joined other webinars, you've seen this, but what I wanted to cover here is really how data modeling and data architecture, and I'm going to include metadata in this because a lot of the value in a data model is the metadata around it. A really a core part of any strategy. You can have a great strategy, but if you don't know what your data means or, or where it is or how it's stored, um, and particularly uh, in this conversation what it means and, and the rules around it, you're not going to get much value. So we often start at the very top of a business strategy starting with the conceptual data model. What are the core business concepts we're worried about? We have a campaign that we're talking about customers, prospects, product. You know, those are the core pieces of a business. And I think when you communicate that right to a business audience, folks get that and, and you're part of the conversation and how you really can link that strategy. So again, you've probably seen this triangle too if you've joined other webcasts, but again, hopefully it's helpful to put it in context. So when I'm talking about business data, I tend to stay either at this conceptual model um, or, you know, it does tie into the logical and, and we could have a whole topic just on this, but, you know, is the logical model physically focused or business focused and I'll say both and you can see that line is strategically placed. Uh, it catches this business rules and at this point you are starting to think about how that may apply to a data structure. This, the focus is still business. Um, but there is some structure around that that we're trying to put in. But I would say at the conceptual level, we really are really trying to model the business unless the technology, or it shouldn't be at all about the technology behind it. It should be completely a business focus. Um, you also see that the pyramid gets smaller at the top, and that sort of hits on the point I mentioned before is that less is more, and simplicity is the beauty of a conceptual model. So if you can think of the bottom of that pyramid where there may be thousands of physical tables can you logically and conceptually summarize those so that we're really just getting that view of customers, products, sales, um, inventory, that kind of thing. And that's the beauty of a conceptual model. So simple is better. So you've heard me say conceptual modeling, we always get the questions, so hopefully proactively <laughs> we'll say this. And I will say, there's our friend Shakespeare up in the corner, if you didn't recognize him. Um, or I'll say the cobbler's children have no shoes, right? As an industry, our whole point is creating common definitions. We're pretty bad at that ourselves. Um, and there's a lot of different names for this model I'm talking about. Uh, some people call it a subject area model, some call it a oh, business data model, enterprise model. Um, seems to be the major theme uh, is, is folks call that a conceptual data model. So in the book that I referenced in my bio, um, data modeling for the business. My co-author, Steve Hoberman, actually did this not a very scientific survey. We had it out in at that day, the DM review with a, a big publication um, of what people call this thing. And we described this thing without using a word. We've called it in our book a high-level model just to avoid that conversation because in full disclosure, Steve Hoberman calls it a subject area model. So I think those 12% go to his classes. I'm just kidding. A lot of respect for Steve. He's a good guy, so I can tease him. Um, 
and the rest of us call it a conceptual data model. So I can say, ha ha, Steve, I'm right, because we actually did a survey, but I particularly don't care uh, what you call it. I think the point, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, is it doesn't matter what you call it. And you probably shouldn't call it a conceptual data model to a business user. I, I would actually recommend not doing that. That sounds very vague, right? So maybe it's your business model, your business data model, your business information model, whatever you call it. Um, the point is communication. So I won't argue semantics, although I think I just spent a minute doing that. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm guilty myself. Um, but we, we tend to do that because we're modelers and we think of semantics and definitions and sometimes we can go a little too far. So I will talk about that more in the presentation. But if you call the thing I'm discussing any of these things, that's fine. We'll have you in our club. Um, and as long as you know what I'm talking about, I think we're fine. So high level model, I think is what we use in the book just to keep it neutral. Um, so, and just to set the context, I mentioned things about metadata. So, technical metadata is hugely important. Um, often folks start there because uh, it's easy, and in many cases, to kind of reverse engineer. I won't say managing technical metadata is necessarily easy, but, um, you know, it's going to get your structure of energy, an energy car or a bar car or whatever. Uh, we're talking today of more of the business metadata. So, what do we mean by employee? What do we mean by customer? And then, of course, the data is the actual customers themselves. But um, one of the reasons I put a picture of Mr. John there is, um, we'll come back to this. I think visual um, presentation, especially at the business level, is so important. Um, and I like to highlight that when I build my conceptual models, because really, if you're thinking of a business, these are concrete things. One of the reasons I don't like the name conceptual data model, it's actually, to me, the opposite. We're talking about the actual concrete things that run a business, right? Locations and customers and products and employees. Those are the things. They're things. They, they exist. They live and breathe in some cases. So um, kind of remind that in, in the picture I have there. Uh, metadata, again, is a, this is a survey um, report uh, I did earlier last, late last year uh, with Dataversity. Um, on what are some of the emerging trends in metadata management. Again, this is broadly metadata and not specifically data modeling. But what's interesting is that 80% of the users of metadata are the business. And, and when we did a survey of a lot of the customers um, or users of metadata, a lot of the conversation was around just this, that it helps business users and IT really understand the context around information um, and really the usage and the business rules and all of that. So for those folks who say, oh, you know, the, the business doesn't care about data, I, I, would, I would argue with you um, that I think 80% are saying they are. I think there's some frustration of how we communicate to those folks in a way they understand. And one tool, uh, by all means not the only tool, uh, but one tool, at least at a starting point, can be this conceptual data model. So they, they will be interested in listening, I do believe. In fact, my next quote, <laughs> I, I just remember this from one of my consulting engagements. We, we were, as a group, trying to sort of convince, the, you know, we were in the IT department talking to the business about how we have to get common definitions and, and almost apologizing for talking to them of we're trying to get the relationships between data and the, and they said, you mean you're not doing this already? <laughs> you know, they sort of expected that we were doing a lot more of this business level design in our systems um, and, and were sort of shocked that we hadn't. So we were a little embarrassed, but that was a, a a positive feedback that, of course, you guys would do this. We would want you to have these definitions. You know, I think sometimes it's so the how. How do we have this um, linkage between folks that, you know, their day job is either selling product or managing finance. Or, you know, they, they may use data, but that's not their main number one job uh, in the day. That's ours, right? So how do we communicate with those folks? So, and, and does conceptual data modeling matter? I think in data modeling, and hopefully we can get over this soon, I'm guilty of it myself, we almost feel like we have to defend ourselves <laughs> for why we're doing this, but it is at the core of so many things. So, a big driver in the growth of data, and we are seeing the growth, is things like business intelligence and analytics. And, and here's an example of, I think, why a conceptual model is important. So, say, you know, the traditional business user in the other corner is saying, can you show me all the customers by region? And I think we all, many of us in the call sort of understand a atypical way we get this, at least historically, for data warehousing. You kind of have your source systems, and a data model helps there with getting kind of the data structures and how it's stored and structured. Um, you might put that in the dimensional data warehouse and kind of get your star schema. And in fact, we talked about that last month. Um, and, and that's it, it can be businessy, but it's sort of on the on the technical side. So we saw, we decided in this hypothetical situation, and we're going to start with a conceptual data model because we saw Donna's data diversity webinar, and we are all gung ho about conceptual data modeling. So we started off with just a very very simple model 
with the basics. What do we mean by customer, right? And we spent a lot of time on this definition because if anyone who builds definitions knows that there's an art to this and a bit of a science as well. It's not just a customer's a customer or customer, you know, those are, you know, the very simple definitions of product ID is an ID of a product. We've all seen those that aren't very helpful. So we can answer one thought. It's a, a person or an organization. You know, we can do B2B or B2C. They've purchased one of, at least one of our products, could be more. They have an active account. You know, that, that could be important. Maybe they're a product, but they've, they've dropped maintenance or, you know, something simple like that. So we spent a lot of time on this, and we were wondering, well, you know, are people going to think this is a little too simple? Um, is this too academic? Um, and they did. <laughs> Unfortunately, this team didn't really understand you know, they thought we were, okay, you academics up there in your ivory tower, you can go debate the definition of customer, duh, that's so obvious. We're going to go do the hard stuff. We're going to, you know, build all that warehouse stuff we talked about in the previous slide. They reverse engineered and created physical data models for each system, so that was great. And they created the ETL scripts and migrated to the warehouse. And then, you know, one of the key things I always stress um, in all my whenever I can, <laughs> is, um, you know, the business value of this. We don't do data just for philosophical reasons. It's generally for some business value. Um, so often it's hard to kind of get ROI from this. So we were actually saying, you know, that bottom bullet, if we can actually send out a welcome email and give people a coupon and say we can actually show ROI that we built this reporting warehouse and these are the actual results of all the people that purchased something as a result. So I thought we were pretty clever for doing that. Um, we implemented it perfectly. The script for fine, you know, we had done all the physical stuff great because we did have the models behind that. Well, until we showed it to the sponsor. Uh, and of course, you know, the business folks, they know their customers more than anything else. You know, just gut feel, if nothing else. And she said, you know, we can't have 2,000 customers in this. I know just gut feel we have about 400. And Jones Tire, they were actually evaluating our product for a 10% global discount and you just gave them 50% off. You know, some sales rep is going to find you at your house <laughs> and break your kneecaps because you just really ruined their commission. Um, and the main thing is you spent all this money in IT to rebuild the port and the data was bad. Um, and that's always me in the front, the one getting the heat, heat and the guy in the back is like, nope, not me, not me. <laughs> anyway, um, what did go wrong, right? We did all the right stuff technically by the textbook. Well, typical, what do you mean by customer? Um, and before anyone laughs or think this is too simple, I have worked for companies that have made this mistake. <laughs> and I don't want to call out a name because I'm sure it's, it happens often, um, unfortunately, these kind of basic definitions. What was happening is we had our, quote, customer database and our, quote, Customer database used by sales. Those were actually prospects, right? And that's an easy thing. I mean, most salespeople say, I'm going to go visit a customer today. Well, often that's actually technically a prospect. I mean, who, who corrects them, right? But, you know, if we're going to put it in a database, those are actually different things. So what happened? This is actually a business result. We sent a discount coupon to 1,600 of the wrong people. We gave upper management a report with the wrong finger, figure. And now we actually have to go back and fix it, right? So what's that saying if you don't have time to do it right? You have time to do it again, right? So a lot of problems just got caused by something as simple as a bad definition. So this time we started again with a conceptual data model that a, with our beautiful definition that's there. So a prospect is a person or organization who doesn't own a process, a product that is looking at it, and a customer is someone who does and has an active account. So again, super simple business definition, but very, very important business results. So again, hopefully this very simple business definition uh, kind of showed that this does have an actual business impact. And the other thing is, I talked about this a lot in the enterprise architecture webinar I gave a couple months ago, this doesn't have to take forever. I mean, it can. I mean, some of these things, maybe we don't agree with the definition of the customer and it takes some iterations, but sometimes it's an afternoon whiteboarding and just taking that first step and starting um, can go a long way. And yes, the metadata repository behind it and published models is all great, but I, I wouldn't be afraid of even starting um, because sometimes you can just flesh out some really simple stuff by a simple whiteboard in an afternoon or an hour with some folks. Um, so uh, the importance of business definitions, you've probably seen these cartoons in other forms before because I'm like, hey, if you have data modeling cartoons, use them. Where else can you see data modeling cartoons? Um, and this probably isn't funny. Unless, maybe it's not funny at all. Uh, but it, it, unless you're in the business, right? We're all, all done with acceptance testing and everything looks great and this new marketing application. This little question, what do you mean by customer? Well, as we just showed, that it's really hard to fix after the fact. Um, you've built the whole system and your basic definitions were wrong, right? So to get the basic requirements before you start, and that's where a conceptual data model can help. Another data modeling cartoon. Um, so the other thing, and I might differ with some others in the industry, use the language of your audience in the model. Um, so a couple things. One is 
display a way that's intuitive to them. So some folks say, oh, a business person can't understand the model. You know, it's too tough. Well, you should build it in a way they do. We use PowerPoint all the time, right? We think in pictures. We tend to um, understand things. So a lot of, I've seen presentations from business users, they didn't call it a data model, but it sort of looked like one. You know, they might have even boxes with things like product and customer and lines between them. They're just trying to suss out their things themselves. Um, and it becomes very much like a conceptual data model. You know, put it in the PowerPoint. Do the model and put it in PowerPoint if that's how folks want to see it. Um, use business terms and avoid excess detail, which I think is a beauty. If you think of that pyramid again, keeping it simple. Um, and to totally show my ultimate nerdery, this is one of my favorite <laughs> quotes, a shoe obfuscation. So if you're not familiar with what that means, it basically means avoid using big words to overcomplicate a simple term, uh, which is sort of, I don't know. Sort of fun. And I live in Boulder, Colorado, where there are many other nerds, I guess, because this is actually a bumper sticker that people have. Um, and in writing circles, this is sort of a joke that people use. You know, if you can use 10 words, but you could use two, use two. You know, don't use a big word just to make yourself sound smart. And I think uh, we do that sometimes in technology. If we just use a lot of big words and show people how smart we are in technology, won't they think we're great? No, actually, I think the opposite. I think we scare a lot of business people. They don't want to talk to the techie ITs. Either we're talking down to them or we're talking that geek stuff. So, you know, a shoe obfuscation, keep it simple, stupid, I guess, is the, the quick version of that, um, and talking your business's language. So this raises the eternal question that I know keeps you up at night. Uh, can and should a business person learn a data modeling notation? So can, I think I already talked about it. Yeah, of course they can. This should not be hard. This is not brain surgery. Um, I think the beauty of a model is that it's simple. The concepts that we're describing can be hard. Uh, should, should they? I would say we should build the models in a way that they don't have to, um, but they can. And uh, I'll go through uh, a quick, you know, 101 of modeling for those folks who might be business people on the call or might be familiar with modeling and or uh, a nice way for you to describe modeling to your business stakeholder. Um, so here it is. So again, if you've never seen modeling, this is a little primer for you, but I think more importantly for the technical people on the call, you should be able to explain your model uh, to a business person in about five to 10 minutes quickly with slides like this. And I think they should be able to get it. People are smart um, and the model should be simple. So an entity, those are your nouns of the business, right? The who, what, where, why, when, the who might be a salesperson, what might be a product, you know, how we're invoicing people through an invoice. Uh, and there's the DEMA dictionary definition of it. But you know, again, I wouldn't start there. I'd just say this is the nouns, right? You might even start looking through requirements documents to or I mean business documents, when you build your model, and I often do this, just draw boxes around and out, right? Those are often your business entities. I keep hearing about products and this, well, we must, it's probably an entity, right? So nouns are the entities. Um, attributes are, are ways to further describe that entity. So again, employee, last name, first name, hire date. Yeah, this is fairly basic. I think most business people would understand this is the descriptions, the adjectives about the thing. Um, and even the model there at the bottom, that's pretty straightforward. You don't have to get into the fact that that thing on top is a primary key. But if you did, just call this a unique identifier for this thing. You know, people can understand that. Um, and then the attributes are around it. So that should be fairly straightforward to people. Um, the next one are the verbs of the organization. Um, and if any of you uh, have heard my full story, which I'll shorten here, um, I was probably one of the few, I don't even know if they teach it in school anymore, but diagramming a sentence. I think I was six years old and they did the diagramming sentence, which kind of, um, you, you underline the verb and you, you circle the nouns and you put a downward line to a prepositional phrase. It's very much like data modeling, actually. So I knew I was a data modeler back then. I think it was the only kid in class that really, really got into it. I still diagram sentences down to that. Um, in a way, it's like I often start with drawing a box around the nouns, the one at the bottom, a department employee. Draw a line under the verbs. That's really your, your relationship line, right? A department can contain more than one employee. Again, you can take a lot of these business rules that are part of your organization that might exist in some documents and really kind of easily that way start turning it into a data model. Department can contain an employee. A customer can have more than one account. Those are, you know, uh, th those are the relationships, the sentences of your business. And some tools, or you can write scripts around the tools that can take your data model and generate these type of sentences. So we just did a workshop in our practice, actually, I wasn't there, my team in the UK <laughs> did this, but um, 
where we took the model and created these business rules and we had the meeting with the business stakeholders, we read them the sentences. We didn't necessarily, but we also showed them the model, but to kind of check the model is, you know, does the sentence make sense to you? Uh, no, a, a customer can only have one account. A customer and account, those, those are almost the same thing. In fact, we could call an account a customer. So that's wrong. You might have more than one, um, you know, wallet. We call them wallets, what you call an account. You know, all this kind of thing, uh, they get flushed out by sometimes just these simple sentences. Um, and then cardinality, that's a great big word um, that we can make, go as that issue obfuscation, <laughs> we can make a really simple thing sound really techy and scary. Um, all that is is the how many, right? And I like this little picture. It's if, we all, if you're using the IE um, notation, it sort of looks, if you look at that well, the, on the employee side, the one to many, one is really, if you think of a kid, how many? They hold up their hand, right? One is one finger, the other one's if it turn, it almost looks like a hand, several fingers. I actually, and I am fun at parties, let me tell you, this is the type of stuff I talk about. Um, but when we did the data modeling for the business book, I, again, we were curious. There's a lot of different notations. Some people like IDEF, some people like IE, you know, there's a lot of different ones. I actually created a simple business rule and put it in a data model. And ran it by a bunch of my friends. Again, I am fun. Um, and uh, folks that one was a painter, one was a sculptor, one was a musician, one was an architect that built houses, there was a finance person, one was an engineer. None of them were in data, per se. And I kind of said, what do you think this means? Most of them looked at the one that was the, the notation here and could kind of get it. Well, there's one thing and there's kind of many things and it looks like a department can have more than one employee. I mean, a lot of people got it without my even explaining anything. They just bought the notation. So I'm a big fan of this one. But again, let's not be too academic. I just find that when I'm talking to business users, this one seems to kind of make sense for folks. So I tend to like information engineering, which is crow's feet, a lot of people call it, um, or children's fingers, whatever they call that. Um, it kind of looks like a crow's foot as well, but that doesn't show the, the many. So anyway, that is it. I mean, how long did that take, right? Here's another one, supertypes and subtypes. It can sound so complicated, uh, but it really isn't. It's either or or and, right? So here, you maybe just draw an example. A vehicle, if it's an exclusive or, which is X, exclusive, again, in this notation, um, can be a car or a truck. It cannot be both. Oh, we can argue there's some cars that are some, but in this particular business, there are cars and there are trucks and they're not the same thing. You can't be a car and a truck at the same time. You're one or the other. Or you could have an inclusive subtype where I'm a person and I can be a customer and I can be a employee of that company. And that might be kind of a thing to talk about. Oh, wow, if our employees are buying the product, they get a discount. Do we not let them buy the product? We got, you know, could be a conversation right there. Um, and just as a joke, I, I was a, spent the time in marketing at a data modeling company, and my boss at the time was not a data modeler. She had grown up in marketing, pure business person, um, wanted to know a little bit of modeling. And I, would, I put this in a presentation. And at first, she's like, what's that X? And I just explained. She's like, oh, um, it made a lot of sense. It, it just was a way to explain. We were talking about campaigns, and we were segmenting customers. And this is my way of saying we don't want prospects. We do want customers, that kind of thing. Um, and she liked it, and like, she kind of joked, oh, that's an exclusive subtype relationship. And that was sort of our joke the rest of the uh, time I worked for her. She was a marketing person. She loved to talk about exclusive subtype relationships. That's probably rare. You should, <laughs> you should not use that type of terminology um, when you're talking to a business. Um, but the point is, this is a particularly easy one to understand. And, you know, I've heard folk, again, I might go outside the lines when we say what's purely a conceptual model. There's been an argument of, you know, are, should supertypes sometimes be in the conceptual model? I think so, because I think it makes a lot of sense. You're, you're starting to flush, 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 I can talk, business rules, like can a car and a truck be the same thing? We're a car manufacturer. What about these hybrid vehicles? Or could there be a third thing? Now, these are very important concepts. And it's pretty easy to understand. So, yes, I would say, I'll put myself out in a limb, that, yes, you could put um, a supertype subtype in a conceptual data model. The other thing that might cause some disagreement with me, but I'll stick to it, um, is that do we use the business terminology? Or you know, a common thing in the industry is this idea of, say, a party, right? The beauty of the party model, and that sounds like it's a good time, is, you know, you, you could have, I mean, there's just certain things about a customer, an employee, or, or a client and a customer that are similar. Can we roll them all up into this concept of a party that's a reusable thing? That's a great idea to use, but I would say when you're talking to the business person, unless you know, I might be legal and there's a party and a dispute and they use that term party for their customers, it means something, then I would use it. But say we had a party associated with an entity, what the heck does that mean? It could be a legal party is associated with a, a legal entity, which is the company, and unless it means that, it's very, very vague. 
at least a thing relates to thing. You could you could summarize things so much that you just said, you know, things relate to things and everything's a thing, and that gets crazy, right? So I particularly prefer to say things like a customer versus a product or employee works for a department. So that's the terms the business people are using. And maybe there's some redundancy when you use the actual physical model. Maybe you want to do that differently. But at this point, we're trying to get the difference between a, uh, you know, business terminology. So I will ask the question. I ask a lot of questions when I do this. Is the customer the same as the party? Is the customer the same as the client? Is the customer the same as the pro? You know, that, that's the type of stuff you're trying to flesh out. Um, you could have two versions of customer on a conceptual data model with two different definitions and trying to say, are they different? You know, this might have to be end game, but you're trying to understand, okay, maybe that's Europe's definition of customer and North America uses something different. Let's try to understand that more. Again, you're just trying to communicate when you're talking about this conceptual data model. And keep the focus in the business. As I mentioned, we can often get academic. I mean, one of the reasons we like, right, like this other thing is that kind of logic we go through, but don't make it a logical exercise. It should be a business exercise. So if you're arguing, let's think why we're arguing. Is it a different entity? Then yes, we should really flesh this out. Is it different names for the same entity? Maybe, yes, that's something we should be discussing. Could it be a super type, subtype relationship? And how you resolve that could be different ways. Maybe we keep the different names. Maybe we try to make it one name. But again, you should be arguing where it's a business definition, not semantics or just theoretical. We can. I, I have to catch myself sometimes. It's just sort of fun to start to think these through. But at some point, you're like, does this matter? Does this matter to the business or are we just being academic? So is a client, a customer, those are the same thing. What's the difference between an ingredient and a raw material? We had a customer, we give an example of in the data modeling for the business book, that there was an argument about that, right? Some folks, is raw sugar an ingredient into a piece of candy or is it a raw material shipped from Brazil that's actually cane, right? So could be either one. There's no answer to that. The answer is how the business uses it. Um, again, I mentioned we just did a modeling workshop for the, our team in the UK, and there was actually an argument whether water was a liquid. So, I mean, this was an uh, environment group that was doing environmental testing, so it made sense. But I think I joked with them. I said, I hope your business sponsor didn't walk by the room when you're arguing with <laughs> Water is a you know some of these things can seem really academic, so I think we should just check ourselves and say, are we arguing this because it means something to the business that we need to resolve, or does it really not matter if you call it a customer or a client? It's the same thing. Just pick one and move on. You know, I think the move on is sometimes what we have to remember when we're doing these. It should not draw out unless it needs to. It should be as quick as possible to do these kind of models. But definitions are important, so uh, don't slack on them. Um, I think this is a lot of the part of, of the model that can be difficult and to think through. And as we showed in the example, you can have a lot of big business issues caused by just something like a ill-defined term. Um, you know, what do you mean by customer? Would beat that one to death. You know, how are we defining household? Uh, if you've been doing that in your business, you know, there's a lot of different ways. Is it family members? Is it people that live at the same address? You, you see, I like this stuff because it's just fun to think, think through all the different combinations or something as simple as how we're calculating total sales. And again, it doesn't mean that you're, you're the folks at the top defining this for everyone. Lots of times it's just showing it. I have some companies working, it's a particular tool I like in the market that will show all of the different definitions and just the why. I'm using this definition of total sales for this report and this one for a different report and this why because you know, the different definitions, and, and as long as you're clear about that, that's fine. It's not like you're dictating necessarily um, how people should do it. It's just being clear about it. You know, sometimes you need to dictate, but not all the time. Um, and then any Italian speakers on the phone, you'll get my little joke about API. The API means B in Italian. I always thought that was kind of cute. Um, so anyway, but, you know, if we're in the financial industry, what's an equity derivative? What's a, one of my first big metadata projects was just listing all these financial terms and what they mean for the brokers. And then we built the, the, the technical stuff behind it. But the hardest thing was getting the definitions right for some of these terms and making sure everyone was calculating in the same way. So don't slack on your definitions. That's a huge part of conceptual data modeling. Um, some tools that actually you can show it on the model. I'm a big fan of that. Um, because then I think, you know, I think sometimes showing something like customer account that just, okay, yeah, but we start to say, you know, customer is a person or organization with an active account. How is that different from a client? Well, a client has an active brokerage account. Uh, no, we can roll those into the same thing. You know, again, that's what the business person would have to make that decision, but often until you can't 
until you see them. You know, is a broker different from a salesperson? Oh, wait, yeah, you're right. I think clients are different because those are the high net worth individuals and a salesperson is any account under 100,000 US dollars, you know, something like that. But unless you see the definitions, it's often hard to see why you have client customer on the same model. Um, so anyway, just a tool I like to use. It could be anything. You could export these out into a spreadsheet. I would say start with the model. But again, it's however your audience wants to consume them because the the big reason we're doing this is for that communication. So again, if a, a sign out in the street is going to get people to read this, I would I would do that. But I don't think you have to try that hard often. I think that like, as the quote said earlier, a lot of business people are actually relieved that someone's thinking about this, um, as long as you keep it simple. Uh, I don't have a slide for this one, but it was a you know, other thing. You know, respect people's times. Make the, you know, I think a lot of business people, if they are none willing to look at your model, might have had bad experience in the time, in the past. I have been in meetings where there's a logical enterprise model with 200 entities uh, printed on the wall that take up two walls, and we say to the business person, we're just going to spend an entire day going through all of this, and if you don't mind, we're going through the cardinality and the relationship. You know, no surprise, they don't want to do that again. <laughs> I, I had one customer that he would put five entities on a blotter, you know, when, the, when his sponsor came in, it would have it on our desk. You just say five entities, five minutes. And you could just look at these really quickly. And you just sort of do a little subject area every morning. Just, I, I just, if I could have 15 minutes of your time or whatever. Often, some of these questions don't take a long time. If you can do it in small chunks, and more importantly, do it in something that makes sense to them that's a business problem. Hey, I know you're doing this marketing campaign. Can I just double check with you? When you say customers, do you mean existing customers and prospects or just existing customers? Well, that wasn't hard, um, but it's just asking the question. Or if you need to model a small model like this, I just wanted to know what do you mean the difference between customer and client? I, I drew this out. Does this make sense to you? Something like that. Sometimes that's all you need. It doesn't have to be a whole day workshop with you know thousands of entities on a wall, because I would hate that as well. <laughs> no, actually, I would like that, but I'm I'm weird. Um, and, and again, human metadata, I always say avoid that dreaded. I just know, I, I cringe when I hear that. We don't need to find customers. I get that. Well, you get that, but your definition may not be somebody else's, you know? So a lot of this metadata in a company is an employee's head, you know, the, the guy in the picture. Well, part number, oh, that used to be called a component number. Those are really the same thing. Well, he knew that. Did anyone else? Putting that in the model and making, you know, this tribal knowledge, enterprise knowledge is a huge part of the model. So it's talking to these people. It's, it's getting it in the model, having the different pieces of it. It might be showing this person a small model kind of, making sure, excuse me, that this is kind of published out to the organization. And here's my little, my, my counseling for the day. I, I think of this, wouldn't the world be a better place if we all did conceptual data modeling? Because it really helps communication. And wouldn't this help our daily life too? Uh, so one of the weird things we do in the U.S., or some of us, uh, I never have had to do it, but uh, children have a summer vacation and parents say, what's this great idea? We've got this lovely large country. We're going to drive across in the summer. We're going to see all the different sites. And I think many a divorce and many a you know, brotherly, sisterly feud have been caused by being stuck in a car for weeks on end driving across the United States. Um, so wouldn't it have been better if we all said, let's go on a family vacation? What do you mean by vacation? Right? So maybe the father is like, you know, I think this is a great opportunity to learn, learn new things. And I want to step in every state park in every state and learn a new fact at each one. And mom goes, you know, I really have been working really hard. I just want to read a book. So you can you know, go to your stupid state park. I'm going to sit in the car and read a book. And Jane has been studying at university for a while. She goes, you know, Dad, you can stay in your stupid park and Mom read your book. I'm going to go out and take a run because I have been studying for weeks and I just want to get outside in the state park. I'm not going to go look at the interactive exhibit, Dad. That's so stupid. Um, and Bobby didn't want to go at all. He's like, for me, vacation is staying home, being with my friends. So could I just skip this whole thing altogether? And Donna, she's like, well, as long as I have my laptop. Um, and I can be building data models in the car, then I'm good. All right, and then Ian, the Brit, he's like, you Americans, I, I call that a holiday. You don't even know the right word, right? So all of this conflict, uh, just from something as simple as what should have been fun, a vacation. So if you think of it, if we often define our terms, right, uh, let's, let's go to a party on Friday. What do you mean by party? Um, maybe you could be annoying, but I think you, you can see that sometimes just getting basic definitions of things before you start a project uh, can avoid issues. So. Um, feel free to date a model with your family if that's going to help things. 
uh, hopefully an illustrative example. So the other part of we've been talking about a bit is that we are visual creatures. And the other beauty, yeah, I mentioned you can put some of this in a spreadsheet. That's fine. Um, but the beauty of a data model is that it is graphical. And we tend to, as humans, think in pictures. In fact, this is an actual cave drawing found in southern France. No, just kidding. It was actually an IDEF notation, that one. Uh, bad joke. Uh, but we do, we tend to draw. We draw. We think in pictures, we draw in pictures. So that's one of the beauties of a conceptual data model is that it's very graphical and pictorial. So one of the things I do uh, in most of my consulting projects, and it, it's something that most people, if any of my clients are on the phone, they may giggle, because most people do the first time until they look at it. And then they're like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. So I often just put literal pictures of things in a model, right? And this has been very helpful at several clients. Uh, so, you know, I'm talking about a salesperson that sells a product. He's oh, product in a box? No, 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 no. Our products are all online games. You know, we wouldn't actually have a box for that anymore. We used to sell them in stores, and now it's all online. So there's no box. Okay, well, there's a, you know, thing right there. And salesperson, support rep, okay, there's support reps on the phone, but, you know, salespeople are actually all on the phone, too. We don't have any. You know, so I, I, I've had several uh, customers where, it, you know, things came out of the model just uh, from drawing it out this way. Um, the other thing it sort of makes it, in fact, <laughs> it, it sort of makes a drawing of what the business is. So several of my clients, I have one, I did some work for an outdoor industry, and it was Stefan Kraus, and he worked in St. Moritz, and he was a ski instructor, and he purchased products, so we had this thing all around Stefan. There was also a Stefan Kraus who was an accountant in Zurich, um, and he had certain characteristics and a certain salary, and because he was in Europe, he was subject to GDPR. You know, all the sort of stories around that customer, especially when you're trying to explain, you know, the connections between data or why it's important. Um, I think it really starts to click with a business person. The customer down on the right was he was Stefan. I know he was Martin Stike. He was a high net worth individual who had different accounts in different countries, and he had yacht insurance and all these sort of things. Um, and it's funny, during the product, people start to say, well, well Stefan would <laughs> actually start to sort of relate to it. But that's the purpose, right? Um, but the client I'm at today is a healthcare provider, and, and their, their complaint was the, the picture we had, the guy looked too healthy. I'm like, well, how many hospitals actually, the people are actually just very attractive with a Band-Aid on, right? You don't actually have sick people, right? But the story was around, you know, the hospital visits and the, and the different claims and all that. So it really is, is kind of a nice one-pager at a pictorial level. Um, I've had different aha moments with different um, business people. One was, well, that doesn't describe our customer, Do, you know, they're younger or they're older. or So you can laugh that that's the feedback they had, or you can say, wow, we've got them engaged. They're starting to see their business in this, right? Or another business person said, oh, so I get it. The hard part of the warehouse is the relationships between those things, right? That we might have been missing a relationship. Yes, there's no connection between a salesperson and product. We need to add that. Or, you know, it, it sort of makes it very real um, because you're literally seeing your business. And the reason I started doing these is, A, I'm a goofball, and B, it helped me when I go into another customer, a new customer, a new business maybe I haven't worked with, it helps me tell the story of what is this data doing? Why are we doing it? How does it flow? Um, and I said, well, I will show it to other people. And there's my tip for you. I think it really does work because it kind of makes it very concrete um, for the business. Um, because we do tell stories. Uh, not only are we pictorial, but everything is a story, right? We can't even sleep without dreaming, which is really stories, right? And so I think that the impact of this is what I'm trying to say is they, no one cares about your data model. You might have heard me say this before, and it's sort of sad, um, but they do care about the result. They don't, not that they don't care about data modeling. Um, they want to see the real world impact. What's the story? Why are we doing this? What are the results of that model? And what we're trying to say is that we can't link sales to salesperson because there's no relationship there. Or if we could, think of all the great things we could do. And I think sometimes we miss the so what. Uh, when we do modeling, we can stay too much in the database level. So, um, you know, I'm not saying you necessarily read data models to your children before they go to bed, but, but the, the point is, it's not the model, it's the message. Um, and I had to remind myself, in fact, in many of my training classes, I kind of say that, I'm sorry, but nobody cares about your model. And I was working with a customer, and we do, we get into what we're doing. It could be anything. It could be a thing you're writing, an article you're writing. It could be your own taxes, you know, anything. You're in the middle of something, you're, you're, you're in it. And, and the customer, you know, wasn't connecting that day. I think they probably had a big meeting, and I had to joke to myself, Donna, nobody cares what your data model. You know, what was the story you were trying to tell? So, you know, I, I tease myself, too. It's like these are the things you have to remember. It's why are you showing this to somebody? What's the scenario? 
Um, another, you know, you might have seen my guy in the lower left, but somebody encouraged me that they said they actually liked it, so you're going to see him again. Uh, but it reminds me, this is me. You saw my picture in the beginning, but inside, I'm that little guy in the lower left. And, and, and so my point of the slide is that there are different personalities and different goals in the organization. Everybody's that guy in the middle. What's in it for me? Right? But I think there's also different personalities. So we as data architects, we probably went into data architecture because we're focused on things like architecture and technology. And often, we're sort of hired to fire, find problems, right? We find, find problems and we fix them. And that can often make us seem very negative, right? So business people, they're very results-oriented. The salesperson, almost by definition, is just genetically positive, you know, the customer said, no, I'm going to ask again, you know, and, and it's all about opportunity and business growth. So that's sometimes where we clash and we can be seen as really nerdy. That might be surprising. So you might be wondering this little, what this little guy, I'll explain it. So we're often seen the kind of that weirdo on the side of the street, you know, holding up the sign going, the world is going to end if your model isn't third normal form. You know, well, we might be right. Maybe the world will end if our model isn't third normal form, but the business person doesn't care. You know, why should I care that it's in third normal form? Tell me the what, the so what. So that's my recommendation on the right. Can we be the same person on the left inside? <laughs> oh, but, but, but put on the hat. We all wear different hats. Of more of a data advisor, less architect and more advisor. So think of the opportunities. Less, hey, guys, we can't do this with a model, or this is broken, or this is really hard. It's, hey, if we could link customer data with product, think of the stuff we could do. Um, so what are we doing different on the right? Well, we're talking in the business person's language. Why, what do they want to do? They want to get more money. They want to increase sales. So if we could do this, we're, being, we're thinking of opportunities, not problems. It could also be a product problem. We can't link customer with product, um, and we're trying to get funding to do that, but we're saying it in a positive way. Think of all the great stuff we could do if, because um, that's often how really successful business people live and work. That's why they're successful. <laughs> they always think of the next new thing. And we can get annoyed by them because sometimes they forget the details. And that's what we clean up after <laughs> if we're talking to them. That's really what they're thinking of. And that's really what I think is fun about data management and why I'm still in the business. Because um, especially with data now, there are so many cool things we could do. Um, so putting on that hat, especially when you're speaking with a business executive, that's where you become data advisor and less data architect who's the weirdo with with the sign in Birkenstocks, which we all are part of probably all of those, right? So just think of your audience, I guess, is the message there. Um, and, and we do the same thing, right? As I mentioned before, do we really, we're all into our models. Do we care about the details of other people's jobs? So think of an accountant, right? So we talk to the accountant, we knock on his door, and he's like, you know, we recently switched to accrual-based accounting based on cash-based accounting because, and you're like, I really just want my paycheck. Do I need to know all the details of the accounting system? I, I just want my paycheck. So again, business people are the same thing with a data model. Well, why would I care? I just want the data for this report, or I just want to make more money through sales. How can I do that? How can data help? Me? So, you know, it's not that folks are bad people or that people don't like data. I think actually a lot of people are interested. You just really don't care about the details of what we do because we do the same thing. Think of any job, you know, I have a an electrician come to fix my house. I really just want the light switch to go on. I don't know the details. You know, sometimes you are, you kind of want to know what they're doing, but in general, you just want the results. You don't care about the details. So, um, again, if you've been in any of my workshops, we often kind of have this as one of the, the uh, exercises. And I think, you know, driving home, think of this, or if you're at work or wherever, over dinner, think of this. Um, how would you describe your project to the CEO in two minutes? And this actually happened to be once in the U.S. We always said, what's, what's the elevator pitch, right? You're riding up the elevator with the CEO, and they ask you what you're working on, or you, you have a sales prospect in the elevator. What, what would you say to them in two minutes or however fast your elevator is to sell them? So what you probably don't want to do on the left is, you know, I'm working on a project to rationalize metadata across data, so you, you've lost them. Right, that's really not very interesting to other folks. But if you can put it in their context, while well, I'm working on that big uh, online marketing campaign you're doing, we're going to get a better customer list so that you can have better content targeting, or you know, whatever it is you're working on. Think of it, the context targeting. You know, my story is this actually happened to me. I was working on a custom uh, one of my first programming jobs way back in the day when I was a software engineer, um, and I was riding up the elevator with the CEO, and he did say almost literally just this. So, what are you working on? And I told him about the program. He said, but what does that program do and why? And I couldn't answer it. <laughs> so it was partly my manager's fault for never filling us in with the big picture, but it was partly my fault for not thinking of the big picture. I was so focused on getting that application to run. I knew what my little piece did, but I really couldn't tell the big story. 
So that was embarrassing enough that that never happened again. Um, and hopefully you think of it before that may ever happen to you. Um, or, you know, in anything, it's not just riding up the elevator. It could be anything. When you, before you give your presentation, before you do anything, what's the so what? And why do you care? And why would people care? Um, so that, that's basically it. When we're thinking of this, you know, a lot more we're going to talk about, but again, in the spirit of keeping it simple, um, with conceptual models, we're focusing on the business, business stakeholders, business roles. So focus on what is interesting to them. Have your presentation suit the audience. Keep it simple. And think of the story, right? Well, it's your elevator pitch. Um, and don't make it overly complicated. So before we open up the questions, just a little bit, if you did have a question and it doesn't get answered today or you just want to say hi, um, I'm, here's my email. I'm also on Twitter as well as our company and my personal website. Um, a little bit about my company, Global Data Strategy. We do this for a living, so if you want help, let me know. Um, there is a metadata management course online. In addition, if you're at EDW in Atlanta, we'll all do the whole half-day metadata session. Um, but if you just want the, the nuggets online and you're in your pajamas, you can watch this. Um, and just if you can join us for any of the others, there's a whole lineup for the rest of the year if you are interested. So without further ado, Shannon, we can open it up for questions. Donna, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. We had a lot of great questions coming in. To answer the most commonly asked question, just a reminder, I will be sending out a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested throughout the webinar. We did have a request for the um, the report, the metadata uh, report that you were showing earlier, so I'll get that out to everybody as well. So just diving in here, Donna, to the to the questions. You know, this can this question came on um, early. You may have addressed it a little bit, but um, have you seen conceptual data models done for the BI later? Yes, and in, uh, the, uh, in fact, I had a slide I took out, um, and, and that is something I've often heard. Why isn't um, BI your star schema? Isn't that just a physical thing. Um, and I had a slide that actually looked like a star, and, and I think when you're thinking, think of a star scheme, I'm reporting on sales by region, by customer, all those things you're reporting by. I mean, I often just do a very high level model that is the star schema and make sure do I understand just what those dimensions mean? Do I understand how we're summarizing? So I think yes, and I'm not sure why that is so often fought with me that, well, no, 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 it's a well, of course it's a physical, you're building a warehouse. But if you don't get, I would think even more importantly with BI, if you don't get those core definitions, then your reports aren't right. So I, and, and try to just understand with the business, what are we reporting by? And I have just kind of a very simple, you know, might be a, you know, the, the, the entity in the middle and some stars around it. <laughs> and that, that kind of makes sense. This is the main thing we're reporting on. And this is the slices of the dimensions we're reporting by. So, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense for business intelligence. So, uh, as I know, Dr. Peter Chen, the inventor of ER model diagram, considers ER model as conceptual and wished it to be used by the business people from the very beginning, but with very, um, what has been changed in, since Peter's time and approach? Um, well, I mean, I, I think I would agree with him that, you know, there are business people that can understand a pure data model. Um, I think, well, I'm just seeing a trend in the business in general. I mean, I had to kind of switch my thinking. Um, you know, often it's been very prescriptive. You know, you sort of design and then you implement and you build. And, and I almost think the difference between an encyclopedia and Wikipedia, you know, this whole idea of, of crowdsourcing. Um, so I guess I've just been more creative in my approach. And, and so, you know, some of these things like pictures, I think, you know, I, I've sort of seen even just metadata repositories where there's comments and threads and almost like a Slack channel for metadata. Um, so I, I think. I think some of the core concepts are the same. Um, he's done a lot for the industry, but I think, and I have to get my brain around it often and say, you know, this is a good thing. It's not as structured, <laughs> it might be more agile, um, but I think so some of these creative, maybe it is a Slack channel for metadata. Maybe it is a picture that just gets the idea across and maybe you put it in the model later, or maybe it's iterations of the model. Um, I think the smaller bite-sized chunks in the ADD world with small amounts of time, Happen. So, I, you know, I think the core concepts are the same. I think we've gotten a little more creative on the front end uh, for some of this when we talk about the conceptual model. My two cents on that one. Sure. So, m one of the challenges I find in building data models is showing the relationships in a way that is simple and palatable for business users. Do you have any opinions or recommendations on software options for developing data models? Um. The relationships, I have two ways I show those. Let's see if I can go back to my screen. Um, 
one answer, because I think the relationship, well, well, one answer as I'm looking for my slide is I wouldn't, I show only the relationship that makes sense. I mean, if you're doing a bigger model, sometimes it is those relationship lines that get really gnarly, for lack of a better word, very quickly. Um, so that's one thing, and this, many of the data modeling tools in the market, I never say the name of any tool, so stop asking me if that people did not that you did. <laughs> I often get that question, but I will not answer that one. Um, you can hide and show on the same model different relationship lines. Um, but if we think of the one that I had that was just the, oh gosh, I'm losing my mind, it's late in the day, uh, just this kind of one, the, the, the story kind of one, I often will do this in a PowerPoint. And, and just this, if I'm really just breaking down the core concepts, um, I have to do a PowerPoint, just show a PowerPoint line, and, and the, this almost looks more like a data flow, and it's not typically your one-to-many relationships, but it's, it depends what you're trying to show. If you're just showing basic, these things relate to these things and the connections are hard, I show that. If I'm showing relationships, I do it more in the way that we showed with the IE, um, and I will show crow's feet, uh, because I think that does make a lot of sense. I think very quickly, even on this one, a, a, what I like about that is that a customer can have one or more employees and he starts from the cat and cardinality. And I often hide the detail. You'll see here in this modeling tool, it's just, just the name, and the, you know, it kind of simplifies it. So I'm a fan of crow's feet notation, and most of the data modeling tools have that. So it's not necessarily always the tool. It's either PowerPoint if you're doing really simply, or in the modeling tool, use the notation, but just simplify it. Don't show all the attributes and all the relationships, just a few of them. That makes sense. Some models. Sure. Yeah. So um, when building an enterprise conceptual data model, um, should you capture all attributes, key attributes, or no attributes? Oh, good question. Who answered that one? Up? So that was a, that's another, I would say, here's the great consultant answer. It depends. No, but I would say what it depends on. I think if you're just trying to get this main, I'm trying to get a department of more than one employee, um, then yeah, I think sometimes hiding that detail is, is good. Um, for an example, sometimes if the, I like to show attributes, if they're not overwhelming, probably not every single attribute. For example, I'm talking about customers, um, and I show gender code, and people say, oh, no, we only sell to corporations that wouldn't have a gender. So I think if the attributes show, um, help clarify the meaning, I definitely show them. Well, what, what's the department? Well, we have a department head. You know, these examples might not be good because it might be odd, but where it's not obvious. Uh, or my hero with the example I had with a car or a truck. Well, what are the attributes of truck that would be different from the attributes of car? And that might help answer if they're different. So if it's helpful, I add them. I probably would say you don't, unless there's only a small amount of attributes, show all of them. I would say probably never show, because that's when you're starting to get into logical and it gets overwhelming. So I would say either none or that small subset that kind of adds clarity to your discussion of these are the things that seem to be different, or this is what makes up a customer that's different than a client, or something like that. So I hope that helps. Indeed. So, you know, how do we incorporate this data modeling into the Agile methodology? I think it is perfect for Agile methodology. Um, I have, the, the partly when you're doing a um, model right, it is a small subset. And, and often when you think of Agile or a sprint or a requirements phase, it's getting that requirements from the business and turning them into stories. So this would be at the very beginning, just making sure we're getting the right um, Right requirements is a huge part of it. And the beauty of these concepts, well, they should be iterative. You should change them, as I mentioned before, but arguing, arguing isn't a bad thing. That's exactly the point. The point is communication. So it should change around. And at the beginning of a sprint or during a sprint, you can use this to help kind of vet out the data aspect of it, and it should change, and it should generate discussion and kind of turn into the stories. It's the context behind the stories you're, you're doing in your sprint. So I think it's perfect for, because it's so quick. It, it, it isn't like you have to develop a whole physical or logical model. You can just start to do some of the conceptual stuff to vet out just the pieces that make sense or get clarity. I almost always draw a model when I start to have questions. Do you mean X or Y or Z? And, and often that model can help be clarity, uh, generate clarity is a lot faster. All right, I think we have time to sneak in one more question here. Uh, do you have recommendations, considerations for the taxonomy standards selected for building a conceptual mon model? Um, uh, no, I mean, I think, I mean, taxonomies can mean different things for people. Some people like it kind of the super type, subtypes. Um, I would say whatever makes sense. Often taxonomies are good outside of a model, sometimes kind of just showing a hierarchical approach and kind of a, um, a list, a structured list helps. So I think whatever kind of makes sense for the business. 
I kind of sometimes like this approach, kind of a hierarchy, kind of taxonomy. Um, I think I think also sometimes you know, everyone is being something different about some of these taxonomies, which I'm being vague in my answer. Um, the other thing that often comes up is if I have different meanings of a a thing, um, a customer could be a client. You know, I often will just show kind of dotted line relationships to those rather than try to I think oftentimes people try to force everything to be the same or it might just be a taxonomy or a hierarchy. So I think sometimes the, uh, the conceptual model can help flush that out. Well, Donna, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love the questions that are coming in. But unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording of the session, and also include the research report that we uh, worked with on with Donna that she talked about on metadata. And thanks to IDEA for sponsoring today's webinar and helping us make it all happen. We appreciate it and I hope everyone has a fantastic day. Thanks, Donna. Thank you.